Hello and welcome to the Doof Book Club, our monthly live stream discussion of a book chosen by you, our listeners. My name is Matt Freeman and wait, Scott, what's what's happening? Where am I? I I, I don't I, I know I know you're confused, Matt, but your memories will return to you shortly. You're on a podcast. This is actually the sixth time we've done this particular podcast. We did we do it? Are we as famous as the McElroys? Hello, everybody, and welcome. I hope you are all having a wonderful Friday evening. Um, I see people already saying, hey, in chat. Great to see you guys. Uh, for those that are joining us for maybe the first time, we are Doof Media, and we make podcasts and live streams, I guess, about the stories we love. We also arrange uh, this monthly book club. Matt, uh, explain what, what, what the book club is. Each month, Scott and I select five books from a pool of books submitted to us by our wonderful Doof community. We put up a poll for all of the supporters on Patreon at patreon.com slash doofmedia, and we let them vote on which they'd like us to talk about. The book with the most votes wins, and then we all read it. That's right. Then we meet up on the last Friday of every month, a.k.a. today, and we chat about the book. We pull slides for uh, interesting or important moments and dive deep into this book for a couple of hours. For those of you in chat right now, say hello, make comments, ask questions, tell us what you think. Do those things. The whole goal of this particular thing is to be interactive. I don't want to just talk to Matt. I talk to Matt enough. I want to talk to you guys. <laughs> Kirkistan says, who are the McElroys? We changed the timeline, Scott. We did it. We did it. Yes. Um, we see David's here. Kirkistan is here. Five, six, seven. Sammy. Hello, everyone. Great to see you. Um, if you are in here and have not said hello yet, go ahead and do that. Um, yeah, that's that's the thing is we're just going to repeat. I've only pulled like six slides and we're just going to read them all multiple times because of because of the book. That makes perfect sense. How's it going, Michael? Um, hey, are we ready to uh, are we ready to, to talk about the book? I think so. <laughs> um, Matt, well, as people say hello, why don't you tell us what book was picked this month? This month, our patrons voted to read Recursion by Blake Crouch. And here is the summary from Goodreads. Memory makes reality. That's what New York cop Barry Sutton is learning as he investigates the devastating phenomenon the media has dubbed false memory syndrome, a mysterious affliction that drives its victims mad with memories of a life they never lived. That's what neuroscientist Helena Smith believes. It's why she's dedicated her life to creating a technology that will let us preserve our most precious memories. If she succeeds, anyone will be able to re-experience a first kiss, the birth of a child, the final moment with the dying parent. As Barry searches for the truth, he comes face to face with an opponent more terrifying than any disease, a force that attacks not just our minds, but the very fabric of the past. And as its effects begin to unmake the world as we know it, only he and Helena, working together, will stand a chance at defeating it. But how can they make a stand when reality itself is shifting and crumbling all around them? Wow. That was very dramatic. You're doing was, great, Matt. You're I was doing inspired. Great. I was inspired by the audiobook reader, naturally. <laughs> of course you were. Uh, I'm currently trying to make your name go away on the on the Skype thing because it's doing that thing where it refuses to make the overlay go away. But we also have uh, Bobby here. We have David here as well. Trinkard apparently just finished the book right in time. So great timing. That's good planning right there. Um, all right. So what we do, the, the, the fr next thing we do on this whole thing, um, is we talk about what we thought about the book overall before we get into it. And while Matt and I are talking about what we thought about the book overall, that's where you guys, because there's a delay, see? this is a, We're planning for the delay here. So you guys can tell us what you thought of the book. So Matt, why don't you go first? Uh, I thought the book was really well written from a prose point of view. That was probably my favorite thing about it, uh, especially toward the beginning. I was really swept up in the prose and just the beauty of it and the emotionality Um of, of the storyline, especially toward the beginning. And then overall, I thought the concept was extremely inventive and, uh, and f f fun seems like the wrong word because it's actually pretty heavy. A lot of it, it's, sure. you're, it's like really, really emotional. Um, I think that at a certain point it became so convoluted that I was like, okay, I, uh, <laughs> having difficulty feeling anything about this anymore, but I um, and that is a criticism and I think I'll probably reiterate it later on. But 
I liked the beginning and I liked the concept so much that it really kind of made up for all that. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't, I didn't find it particularly confusing, at least like from an emotional standpoint. Um, I, I like, I thought, I thought the, the, I thought the book did a very good job of like getting you to understand with the I say in quote science behind what was going on. I mean, it is convoluted and confusing, but I think the way that the book manages to like lay it out to you. And I pulled a lot of slides where the book, I think like multiple times redefines or defines the rules of this whole thing. Um, So I I thought it did very well in that regard. I really liked it. I thought, I mean, it's, it's a very quick read. Um, in 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 that like i think i read this book in like two days like it's it's 300 pages but it's like they're very quick pages i thought it like just took this concept and then explored it from every different way it could come from um and i found all those things really satisfying and i really really enjoyed the end of the book yeah i like the ending too i think just to be clear i i didn't really think it was confusing but it was convoluted for sure. Like just the number of, of, of loops and yeah, uh, you kind of like lose, like you're like, okay, well the, this, this character basically is a different character now. And now this character is basically a different character now. And eventually you're just like, okay, I've, I've lost my sense of connection to um, these, who these characters are supposed to be. And uh, that, that negatively impacted the reading for me. But um I, I don't think it I don't think it ruined it like the the, the ending still did land for me so mm-hmm. um yeah I just I mean that's really my number that's really my one and only complaint actually so so overall uh, like when you when you can say you have one one big complaint about a book and everything else works really well then I think that's actually like a positive sure um, sure um all right so let's look at what everyone else thought um Kyrgyzstan said they thought it could have been a hundred pages shorter with almost no loss. Um, I think I could see that. I think there like, there are moments in the middle that I think, um, don't really serve where the overall plot is going, but it's just like, let's explore this part of it, you know? Um, and I think, I think you could have right. cut that stuff. Yeah. David said it was a little disjointed after they went to sleep, listening to the audiobook and had a hard time finding the last point you're awake for. I think this is a book in particular that that would be very difficult for, um, with the amount of time it like it goes back to the same moments. That would be very difficult to like to to like scan through fast forward through the audio and be like, oh, yeah, it was the part where they were sitting in the house pondering how they were going to solve the problem. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's it's the part when he's having a, a lunch with his with his ex-wife. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think I pulled uh, all three of those because I loved uh-huh. them so much. OK. Yeah. Um, uh, um, let's see. Uh, five six seven says it's a fun and novel take on the Groundhog Day concept. That's true. I didn't. It didn't really occur to me. But that, yeah, that is that is definitely true because that's basically what the final book of the book is, right? Is them yeah. reliving the same thirty three years over oh and God. over again. Yeah. Um, uh, they, they say they found the con- some of the conflict and drama to be a bit contrived. Um, yeah, I think here and there, I, I think may, maybe so, but not, not so much that I minded. It's so funny to me because I think like the characters kind of disappear for me mm-hmm. outside of Helena and Barry, like Slade is a pretty big part of this book, but he just kind of fades to the background when I think about the story. Like, I, like, I, I don't think he's that interesting of a character, but also like, I don't care. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I think there's like. The Slade that you meet on the oil platform is a different character, effectively, than the Slade that you meet at all other time points. That's fair, yeah. Because he's, like, 200 years older. Yeah, yeah, fair, fair. Uh, Stellated Hexahedron, or Stellhex, um, says that they loved the research parts. They don't get sucked into thrillers unless there's weird science stuff like this, and it definitely grabbed me. Yeah, I think I would agree with that. Um, the, a lot of the this, this specific science fiction tech stuff around how this works and how they discover how it works is pretty fun to read. Honestly, I think, um, by far my favorite part of the book was, I, I want to say everything up until she leaves the, um, the oil rig plus or minus, uh, like, like everything up until he saves his daughter and she leaves the oil rig. I don't know. I don't think those two, two things happen at the same time. But like the first, the first section of the book is by far my favorite. Everything mm-hmm. else is good and entertaining, and I liked it. But it like the first part I found really exceptionally fun, and was like, oh, this book is awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Yeah, I think I, I am almost the inverse of you in that I, I really liked the last half of the best. Well, let's best. try to read some kind of meaning into that. Sure, sure. You um, like science stuff and I like love. Yes, I guess so. <laughs> I don't uh, know if that's it. but Tr- Tr- Tringard says uh, they they liked how each book slash chapter addressed the topic from a different way. That's, yeah, that's yeah, true. That's yeah, that's true. That is true. I didn't really pay attention to that, but I think you're right. Yeah, I mean, there was the, well, let's see what happens when the government gets hold of this chapter, or mm-hmm. book, rather. Um, Michael says one thing they didn't like about Slade when he was first introduced, he didn't like it, it seemed stereotypical. Yeah, he was like Elon Musk, basically. I think I yeah. even called him that in, the, in our notes. <laughs> right, I, I uh, yeah, I was basically like, oh, oh, so this is a play on a rich... Um, uh, Elon Musk type character, but uh, they they did something interesting with it. I thought at least at least. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. All right. So let's uh, let's jump into it and we can talk more about this as we go through the slides. Sounds good. All right. Um, so the opening of the story uh, here, we have Barry trying to talk a woman down from suicide and we learn what FMS is and how it works. <clears throat> I'm pretty sure you don't want to come any closer, detective. Why is that? I have FMS. Barry resists the urge to run. Of course, he's heard of false memory syndrome, but he's never known or met someone with the affliction. Never breathed the same air. He isn't sure he should attempt to grab her now. Doesn't even want to be this close. No, fuck that. If she moves to jump, he'll try to save her. And if he contracts FMS in the process, so be it. That's the risk you take becoming a cop. How long have you had it? He asks. One morning, about a month ago, instead of my home in Middlebury, Vermont, I was suddenly in an apartment here in the city with a stabbing pain in my head and a terrible nosebleed. At first, I had no idea where I was. Then I remembered this life, too. Here and now, I'm single, an investment banker. I live under my maiden name. But I have, she visibly braces herself against the emotions, memories of my other life in Vermont. I was a mother to a nine-year-old boy named Sam. I ran a landscaping business with my husband, Joe Behrman. I was Ann Behrman. We were as happy as anyone has any right to be. What does it feel like? Barry asks, taking a clandestine step closer. What does what feel like? Your false memories of this Vermont life. I don't just remember my wedding. I remember the fight over the design for the cake. I remember the smallest details of our home, our son, every moment of his birth, his laugh, the birthmark on his left cheek his first day of school, and how he didn't want me to leave him. But when I try to picture Sam, he's in black and white. There's no color in his eyes. I tell myself they were blue. I only see black. Boom. And then she it, jumps off the building. I think that, that the like part of the reason why this the, fir- the, the first part of the book was my favorite is literally just because it's playing with these ideas of like, what if your child died or you had a child and then they didn't actually exist anymore? Like there's a lot of child um, uh, abnegation happening, which is sure. which is obviously my Achilles heel. Yes. <laughs> um, and and like just like being forced to actually confront this idea of like, what if you woke up and and like you realized your children weren't really real and you, and you were the only one who remembered them like that, that that would totally drive you crazy. And I could totally understand this character immediately. And just I, I was sucked into the drama of this immediately. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I mean, one thing that that is kind of crazy to me and the reason I wanted to pull this opening specifically is it's because, like, I thought I was in a whole different book. Like, this is almost like a noir, like, mystery story start. Like, this is the, the random beat cop gets called out to a suicide attempt. Uh, he loses the woman and then becomes, like, obsessed with the mystery around why she jumped and, like, finds himself down a rabbit hole. Like, that is a very, like, noir story. And then it, like veers <laughs> veers big from there but i mean that's that's definitely how the opening of this feels and and i think to, to go back to what trinkard was saying not only do i think each of the, the books in this book kind of talk about a different aspect of this this idea of the memories and the chair and all this stuff but i think they're almost different types of novels as well like I, I don't yeah. know like it's just it's just so interesting to me that if you compared this page to like the last page of this book well maybe not the last page but like the part where they're like melting from nuclear explosion as they're trying to go relive another loop right like, I, I just wouldn't have connected those two books together at all yeah i mean right compare compare noir mystery solving to like 
people are running around in the street blind with their skin burned off. Yeah, yeah. So like him, him lying down on the Antarctic ice to die. Yeah. And <laughs> like, like these are all such different. And, and his character changes so much. I mean, I think that's kind of like I, I, I framed it as a complaint earlier, but I think it's just intentional that their characters sh- change so much because so much time passes. Yeah. I mean, um, actual time and relative time. Yeah. Like, and the experience that like he's lived, he's lived with his daughter dying his whole life. He's lived with his daughter alive his whole life. He's lived six lives. Um, w- like with this other woman who ends up being like the, his destiny or what, what have you. Right. Um, so yeah, he's just, he, of course he's a different person. Right. Yeah, <laughs> five six seven says, "Damn it, Helena, your obsession with hiking almost ruined everything twice." I made that same comment while I was reading when they're like <laughs> sprinting back to the chair. I'm like, "Hey guys, maybe like when the time clicks over, be right next to the chair, just, right? Just in case." Like you knew exactly when it was going to happen. <laughs> yeah, there was no reason for this. To be fair, the first time, like they had no idea how quickly everything was going to go to shit. But the second time, they really should have been standing right next to the chair. Right. But it made a cool skin melting scene. So, you know, whatever. True. Um, One of the other things I'm seeing in the chat is talking about like the fidelity of memory, which is I think if, if I had to think of it, something that the book takes the most liberty with. It's the concept of people's memory are as um, uh, clear and tight as they are um because like i mean i don't know if i'd be able to describe the memories that that this woman describes this way and this is the the other reason i pulled this is because the way she describes memory and the way they talk about memory is is like consistent throughout this book i don't know maybe Mm. my brain's just broken um well that didn't bother me i think maybe people just just have memories in different different ways like like i I mean, I don't know. This is a question for you. Like if, if I say like, all right, Scott, here's a five minute timer. I want you to think about like this, this moment that I know you experienced and just, just, just think about that moment until this timer goes off. Like I'll, I'm just betting that a lot of stuff would come up that you didn't necessarily know that you actually remembered. It might. And- I don't think the things that would come up would be like the smell and the sounds though. And they made such a big deal about how it, you you don't just remember what things looked like, like that it was, you're remembering all the sensations. Mm. Um, I don't know if I'd be able to, like <laughs> I have, I have very distinct memories of like, I, I, I go back to 16 because that's where Helena goes back to. And I have distinct memories of things that happened when I was 16, but I don't think I could get down to the, the level of detail that she gets down to on that. But so are you, are you referring to when they do the memory copying stuff or just in general? To when they, Well, I mean, I think when they do the memory copying stuff specifically, but I think okay. that spreads out into how they describe memories generally. Yeah, I don't, I, honestly, it didn't bother me. And I don't know if that's because I wasn't thinking critically about it or because my memories do work that way and therefore it didn't bother me. Well, I, don't I, ever, know I, I would not be able to use the chair then. That's fine. <laughs> it's probably better for you, honestly. Yeah, yeah. Hashtag skin melt- melting scene says Kyrgyzstan. Yeah, I mean, and, and I think this this is a great transition to our next slide. And I'll go ahead and read it. And then we can talk about like the direction I wanted to to take this in. Because in the slide, Barry is meeting with his ex-wife, Julia, on what would have been their daughter's 26th birthday. Uh, this is the, as it turns out, the most important scene in the entire book. We return to it three times. You look thoughtful, Julia says. I was thinking about the trip we took up to Lake Tears of the Clouds. Remember? Of course. It took us two hours to get the tent up in a rainstorm. I thought it was clear. She shakes her head. No, we shivered in the tent all night and none of us slept. You sure about that? Yes. That trip was the foundation of my never again wilderness policy. Right. How could you forget that? I don't know. The truth is, he does it constantly. He's always looking back, living more in memories than in the present, often altering them to make them prettier, to make them perfect. Nostalgia is as much an an analgesic, why can't I pronounce that word today, Um, for him as alcohol. He says, finally, maybe watching Shooting Stars with my girls felt like a better memory. She tosses her napkin on her plate and leans back in her chair. I went by her old house recently. Wow, it's changed. You ever do that? Every now and then. In actuality, he still drives past their old house anytime he has business in Jersey, 
He and Julia lost it in a foreclosure the year after Megan died, and today it barely resembles the place they lived in. The trees are taller, fuller, greener. There's an addition above the garage, and a young family lives there now. The entire facade has been replaced and redone. In stone, new windows added. The new driveway widened and repaved. The rope swing that used to hang from the oak tree was taken down years ago, but the initials he and Megan once carved in the base of the trunk remained. He touched them last summer, having somehow decided that a cab ride to Jersey at two in the morning after a night out with Gwen and the rest of the Central Robbery Division was a good idea. So the reason I pulled this, I mean, first of all, like we learn more about our our main character, Barry, here. I think that the first slide gave us this this thing about Barry that I love that I forgot to talk about before we moved on, which is his decision that like she says she has FMS and he's like, oh, shit. And then she, he's like, fuck it. If she jumps, I'll go after her because I'm a cop and that's what you do. And I think that's a really great like character defining thing for Barry. But this is another, right? This is him with his wife thinking back of the memories and admitting not only that he, he lives almost entirely in the past, but he's also mutating the past to be a, the better things that he remembers. Yeah, I thought this was interesting. And honestly, I it, it stuck in my head and I thought it was going to come up in an in a important way later. Just this idea that. I mean, obviously, this is just true that that every time you remember something, you essentially decode it and then re-encode it and you essentially damage it slightly every time you remember it. Um, And that's this is how this is literally how all memories work. So I was like this conceit of the story that like physics is actually just this like framework of human memories uh, is cool and fun and fascinating. But I was like, okay. I wonder if they're going to imply that by intentionally modifying your memories to, to to be other than what actually happened, then you can go back into a past that never actually was. Like, what would have happened if he tried to use the memory machine to go back to this camping trip? Would he have gone back to a a, a clear night where he watched Shooting Stars, or would he have gone back to a rainy night? I mean, I I th- I, I think what would have happened is the the measurement factor, which with they measure the like the ability of a memory. I forget what, what they called the measurement, but like you have to be above a, a 120 or something mm-hmm. on this mystical number. I think this memory just would have been below that threshold is, is, is what like, like dualistically or, or sorry, Watsonian, like they would have said, but yeah, I mean, I, I do think it's, it's a, I don't want to say a missed opportunity because that's like demanding a book be what you want it to be. But I do think it's interesting. They, they, they introduced this idea of the fidelity of memory because as I think people were talking about in chat, um, they, they say that he has the struggle to remember whether or not he said, I love you to his daughter before she left the last time. Yeah. Um, and so like they're bringing up these concepts of like how you're altering your member, how you're altering your memory, how your memory, like some, some of the stuff you just don't remember and how that eats at you. Um, but the, the, the sci-fi concept never really dives into that. Yeah, no, and it didn't bother me, but it was something that I was, I guess, in retrospect, I was like, oh, I thought, I thought that was gonna matter. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. It, I mean, o- overall, it's 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 fun because the book has a, a, just so many little sections that are just kind of a meditation on memory. Yeah, yeah. And this is one of those where you don't really mind that it doesn't go anywhere plot wise because it's just a, a kind of neat like rumination, and you're just like, yeah, do I do that too? I guess I mm-hmm. do. Yeah. Huh. I mean, I think the most important thing that it's doing here, I think establishing our main character as a person who lives in the past uh, is a pretty smart thing to do. Um, I think that that is one of the things that links uh, both Barry and Helena together is that they are both people that like are like Helena is looking forward just for the ability to look to the past. Um, And Barry is just obsessed with this this one moment and and what it did to his life. Which, I mean, yeah. fair. Like, I can't imagine losing a kid. Oh, my God. I don't even have one yet, and I can't imagine losing one. Yeah, right. I mean, I think, and, and that's honestly one of the things that made the book hit so hard for me is I was, you know, you're spending all this time with this character. And, you know, I, I thought the, the part where the part where you, you get that he's going to be sent back in time mm-hmm. um, and you're like, oh, my God, he's going get, to get a chance to save his daughter. And I, I was like like my heart was hammering. I was like, Oh, please let him save his daughter. I like, I want this for him so badly, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and of course he's like paralyzed until she leaves. So then we have to do this really intense action sequence. That she's yeah. like, he's like running to her to save her just on time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really emotional. I liked it a lot. I, I, I think that that's a really fun part of the book. 
Um, like, I, well, I pulled a slide on it, so we'll talk about that when we get to it. But let's meet Helena. Sounds good. So our other protagonist, Helena, meets with her new boss, Elon Musk, um, Slade, uh, who has offered to fully fund the building of her chair. Been meaning to ask you something, Slade says, interrupting her reverie. She looks at him across the table. Why memory? Obviously, you were into this before your mom got sick. She swirls the wine in her glass, sees the reflection of them sitting at the table in the two-story windows that look out into, into oceanic darkness. Because memory is everything. Physically speaking, a memory is nothing but a specific combination of neurons firing together, a symphony of neural activity. But in actuality, it's the filter between us and reality. You think you're tasting this wine, hearing the words I'm saying in the present, but there's no such thing. The neural impulses from your taste buds and your ears get transmitted to your brain, which process them and dumps them into working memory. So by the time you know you're experiencing something, it's already in the past, already a memory. Helena leans forward, snaps her fingers. Just what your brain does to interpret a simple stimulus like this is incredible. The visual and auditory information arrive at your eyes and ears at different speeds. Your brain waits for the slowest bit of stimulus to be processed, then reorders the neural inputs co correctly and lets you experience them together as a simultaneous event, about half a second after that actually happened. We think we're perceiving the world directly and immediately, but everything we experience is this carefully edited, tape-delayed reconstruction. So this is, I think, what, um, I forget who it was, sorry, but what someone was talking about when they talked about just like the researching and like the, the science of the science fiction here and how that was fun because this is one of those things that i hate because it like it messes with my depiction of the world i live in and then i just i process it by going well that doesn't matter because i i don't notice it so i'm just gonna force that out of my brain and not yeah. think about it well i'm not uh, gonna think about that this isn't the present right now then and don't meditate scott i i won't i won't ever do it this is why i don't take mushrooms because when you meditate even a moderate amount then you begin to see that you're you're stitching things together and that every moment is actually this this fabrication and that sounds terrifying why would you do that ever uh, well you know honestly i this is kind of why i don't do that anymore because i'm like <laughs> it's it makes it when you start noticing it during daily life which happens eventually you're like okay this is extremely distracting um yeah that's kinda, how you crash a car matt don't it, crash uh, your car yeah or or at least how you're like you're having a conversation with someone and half of your attention is on like the, the whirring gears in your head. And you're like, no, 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 I don't want this. This is not why I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, that's <laughs> just, uh, yeah, yeah. I thought this was fun because Helena was generally not like super talkative, but in, this is one scene where she just, I guess she's a little bit drunk. And so she's, she goes in this monologue. Um, I like this, this bit. Yeah. I like it a lot too. I mean, I think it, 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 it does a lot to like define memory and define the the sci-fi behind what this book is going to be doing with memory but it also just i think this is a, a a monologue that is a is character defining right like we see we see her as this person obsessed with memory beyond like i love that part of her motivation is for her mother with alzheimer's but that's it's not all of it like obviously you were into this before your mom got sick she was obsessed with memory and the concept of memory before her mother it's been something that's it's been with her her whole life um, yeah Right. And, and she's sort of embodying the idea of this of the story, the, the science fiction conceit of the story that memory is indeed everything, which mm -hmm. is which is what Slade says later. It, yeah. It, it's, yeah. it's just a, a, a fabric of of human memories. Mm -hmm. So. Um, what's what's next? What's next? OK, so we're going to jump forward a little bit. I'm sorry, Matt. I, I, I don't think I pulled any. I think that was the only oil platform scene I pulled. I'm sorry. This is. You got you got to get in on this, and you can stop me. It's okay. It was it was a fun part, though. <laughs> it was. Um, this is so Helena has built her chair, and it works. And they've realized that it has the ability to send people back in time. So this is after Helena has said, "That's that's bad," <laughs> and she and she takes off. I, actually, I'm not sure exactly where it is because I think one of the smart things Crouch does here is like he's going back and forth between these two time periods. So like when I was trying to stitch together, like what happens where in my head, both of these things are happening kind of at the same time. Um, and, and which allows the reveals to work 
like almost in tandem, like where you learn how the machine works right before Barry gets into it for the first time. Um, but anyway, this is Barry reliving um, the moment, the last moment that he saw his daughter alive. He wants out of his memory, but he can't leave. All senses are fully engaged. Everything is clear and vivid as existence, except he has no control. He can do nothing but stare through the eyes of his 11 years younger self and listen to the last conversation he ever had with his daughter, feeling the vibration of his larynx and then the movement of his mouth and lips forming words. You talk to Mao about this? His voice doesn't sound strange at all. It feels and sounds exactly the way it does when he speaks. No, I came to you. Is your homework done? No, that's why I want to go. Now he watches himself lift his left arm to glance at his watch, one he will lose when he moves out of this house ten months from now in the wake of Megan's death and the explosive decompression of his marriage. It's a hair past 8.30 p.m. So can I go? Say no. Younger Barry watches the next Rockies player walking to the plate. Say no. You'll be back no later than 10? 11. 11 is for weekends. You know that. 10.30? Okay. Forget it. Fine. 10.15. Are you kidding me with this? It takes 10 minutes to walk there, unless you want to drive me. Wow. He had repressed this moment because it was too painful. She had suggested he drive her, and he had refused. If he had, she would still be alive. Yes, drive her. Drive her, you idiot. Uh, this I, I needed to pull something from this scene, because I think this is one of the most powerful scenes in the book. Uh, yeah, definitely for me. I, I, was, I was like, Crouch... If you fuck me on this. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that's I, I think the brilliance of it is we don't see this this like paralysis anywhere else in the book, really. Like the uh -huh. like everyone else, as soon as they travel back to the memory, they just grasp control of it right away. Um, and I think it's because they know they can do that where he's so confused. He doesn't really try that hard. But just I, I really thought they were just like at, at this point, I still didn't know what the book was doing quite yet. So I was like, are they just going to make him relive this whole fucking thing again? Like, is he just going to have to? And I was like, that's so awful and cruel. And it's like, well, you th you couldn't remember whether you said I love you or not. So let's play back the tape. Did no, you didn't. And and what's more, you a she asked you to drive. She asked right. you to drive. And I, every time it cuts to him looking back at the ba at the baseball game, a baseball game, he can't even remember 11 years in the future. He doesn't quite remember like which team won um it just it, it wasn't even a world series that he was invested in he wasn't rooting for either team yeah. i think that just turns the, the, turns the knife just a little bit more oh yeah it's so perfect yeah the, the just the, the 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 way the way that he's just like so full of shame and mm -hmm. um and it's just awful yeah i for some reason i, I don't know I, I feel like at this point in the story i had like i understood like okay is the it's not false memories it's time travel he's been sending people back in time and he's going to send barry back in time to give him a chance to save his daughter um that's like yeah. i got i got that that's where we were going um i just wasn't sure if he was going to actually make it sure sure yeah i i think you were a little bit quicker on the uptake than me on that i, I hadn't quite gotten it until i think as sammy says in chat when he wiggled his finger <laughs> mm -hmm. uh trinkard said I, they were very tense here convinced we actually went back never believing he was just seeing the memory even though he doubted it, but then thinking he was going to fail. So yeah, it seems like Tringard was on on your team with this whole thing. Um, yeah, I, I, I did actually think, I mean, that that's why it was so successfully dramatic is I thought there was a good chance that he would fail. And then the plot would be, now he has to figure out what happened and then try to like do it again so that he can actually right. change it. I mean, the idea that now like you go back in time to the moment of your daughter's death, could you get another opportunity to save her? You fail to do that. And then you have to relive the next 11 years. Right. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. And, and I think, I think that this is uh, I, I'm sure we'll, I'm sure there's a slide where, where it's maybe more appropriate to talk about this idea, but like the idea that when you have a time machine, you immediately are like, well, I should just use this for everything. Right. Yeah. And then that, that just like breaks reality, obviously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, I think, yeah, that will be a perfect slide to talk about that in a yeah. bit. Okay. Yeah. That was my favorite scene. Um, totally got me. Yeah. Uh, I loved it. Yeah. I mean, I think that's like, you talked about Crouch's prose and I, I agree with you. It's very good. I think it's very like, 
I'm trying to think of a way to phrase this as doesn't sound mean. Like, I don't think he writes like complexly, if you know what I mean. Like, I think his book is it's very quick to read. It's very easy to read, but you get the emotion behind it. I think someone I think it was Tringard said they they weren't in love with the dialogue. I think he uses a lot of dialogue and it's not always like great. Um, but I, I just I found it very easy to read and very easy to get sucked into. Yeah, like um, like when I look at this page, um, there's nothing about it where you're like, that's genius. But when you when you think about like, all right, well, how would I how would I improve any sentence in any way or, or how, how would I make this flow better or how would I make this tenser or how how would I make this hurt more? You just come up with nothing because mm -hmm. it's it's actually extremely tight. Um, I want, I'm going to say again, especially for me, the first half I felt was extremely tight. Um, I feel like I just am less sure what exactly I'm supposed to be feeling in the second half. Uh, and that's, that, that's whatever it is what it is. Sure. All right. Uh, next one. So, uh, Helena confronts Elon Musk about his evil plans and we learned that he's lived all this before. Three days later, the night of November 5th, 2018, I went to the lab and reloaded one of my memories into the simulators. Then I climbed into the tank and shot a lethal dose of potassium chloride in my bloodstream. Christ, it burned like fire in my veins. Worst pain I've ever experienced. My heart stopped, and when the DMT hit, my consciousness shot back into a memory I'd made when I was 20 years old. And that was the start of a new timeline that branched off from the original 1992. For the entire world? Apparently. And that's the one we're living? Yes. What happened to the original? I don't know. When I think about it, those memories are gray and haunted. It's like all the life was sucked out of it. So you still remember the original timeline when you were 46-year-old lab assistant? Yeah, those memories traveled with me. Why don't I have them? Think about our experiment just now. You and I had no memory of it until we caught back up to the precise moment when Reed died in the egg and traveled back into his tattoo memory. Only then did your memories and consciousness from that previous timeline, when you tried to throw a chair through the glass, slide into this one. So in nine years, on the night, on the night of November 5th, 2018, I'm going to remember this whole other life? I believe so. Your consciousness and memories from that original timeline will merge into this one. You'll have two sets of memories, one live, one dead. This is just a very functional section here. I think this is probably doing some some of the biggest heavy lifting in this entire book because this is basically setting up how all this stuff works, which every plot point from here on out is going to lean on you functionally understanding this process. Yeah, I think it works fantastically that that he he has this experimental subject where they they show they kind of show you know, how it's supposed to work and then what happens when you do it wrong and then the way the memory moves, you know, the, the person who travels back in time keeps the memory and then everyone else only gets the memory when they catch up to the point where that person left. Um, it all, yeah. yeah. And I love that. I love that concept. Yeah. Like it's so, it, it is both like a fascinating narrative choice to make and also like, I, I know like none of this, is, all this is garbage, right? But, but like, it, it it makes a certain logical sense to it on some level like that of course until you get up to the point of divergence the two timelines are not going to crash together again and you're like yeah i get it i get it and then i think they further he further builds on that by saying like even though you're you've been living in the active timeline um when you when the two timelines merge together there's like a brief moment where the the consciousness that is you was on the now dead one and hasn't like realized the alive one yet. Um, and, and I just think that's like this fascinating idea to put into this and kind of that's what that's what motivates the conflict going forward. Exactly. Like think about how, how this book would be different if the only person who remembered anything was the person who went back. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the whole last half of the book would be completely different. And, yeah. and th this whole I mean, in fact, the whole motivating, you know, impetus w would be different because there wouldn't even be such a thing as false memory syndrome in the mm -hmm. first place. It would just be, um, it, w it would all be fine. Yeah. Right. So, so it takes this, it takes what is really almost a, um, fairly n normal, but with a twist, uh, time travel concept and then turns it into something much more complex than that. 
Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, as five six seven is saying in chat, it basically takes Groundhog Day and gives it stakes. Like the concept of Groundhog Day is is that nothing you do has any consequence because the day is going to reset. But here, you can still reset the day, and yet everything you do still has consequence. Yeah. Right. I mean, the worst the worst stuff is when I, I almost want to say I didn't like it. I think it's just because it upset me that like it turns out that he ends up like his 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 marriage still fails and his daughter still dies and everything. And you're just like, well, that's depressing. It is. But I, I love that. I love that. And that's actually our next slide. So I want okay. to talk about that. OK. Um, but, well, the next slide is a slide I pulled to get to that point. OK. Um, so. Basically, we're, we move to now, Barry is 11 years into his new life, and he reaches that one point we started the book with, which is his daughter's 26th birthday, but this time, she's here. It wasn't that he'd forgotten. His remembrance of hotel memory, his death in the deprivation tank, and the return of the night Megan died was always there, on the outskirts of awareness, a bundle of grayed-out memories. But there was also a dreamlike quality of the last 11 years. He was swept up in the minutia of living, and with no tangible connection to the life he'd been ripped out of, it was all too easy to relegate what had happened to the deepest recesses of consciousness and memory. But now, sitting in a cafe on the banks of the Hudson River, with Julia and Megan on the morning of his daughter's 26th birthday, he had a blinding awareness of being in this moment for a second time. It all comes back to him in a rush of memory as clear as water. He and Julia sat at a table not far from this spot, imagining what Megan would be doing if she were alive today. He had posited she would be a lawyer. They had laughed about that, and reminisced about the time she drove his car through a garage door before comparing memories of a family vacation to the headwaters of the Hudson. Now, his daughter is sitting across from him, and for the first time in a long while, he is floored by her presence, by the fact that she exists. The feeling is as strong as the early days of his return to the memory when every second shone like a gift. So I, I don't know. I, I found this really powerful and I'll use this as like a jumping off point to talk about what you were just talking about. But this idea of like you were given this, like one of the most incredible gifts of all time, which is the ability to go back in time and undo the thing that, that cost you your daughter's life. Um, and then life sets in and you just kind of get used to that. Like the, the human being's ability to just get used to circumstances is quite remarkable. And I think that's what this, this section is talking about, that he just got used to the fact that his kid was alive and she exists now. And this is just life. And you're just living it one day at a time. And there's nothing special or, or, or miraculous about it anymore. Um, until, until uh, he relives this memory for the second time, remembering what things were like the first time um uh -huh. and i mean i i think like what is it said like at, for the first time in a long time he is floored by her presence which has an in, like implication that he's like eh, it's just megan yeah I'm just right. a kid yeah, yeah. so you... I, I i there's just something so powerful in that and the book is willing to to explore that before it goes on with this other other crazy stuff yeah yeah i, I agree i mean it's uh it's I, I love that it fully it does fully explore the idea of guy with dead daughter gets daughter back and we we see kind of all of the emotional texture of what would go into that experience yeah uh, including just kind of beginning to take it for granted yeah, yeah. um and uh yeah I, I thought it was I thought it was great I, I like that that he takes his time in this in in this stuff like he really yeah maybe my, my favorite part about the book is that it's not just like rushing through action trying to trying to like do this complicated intricate plotty stuff with time travel like it really could have been that book right like it could have been like oh look at how intricate and, and complicated this book is it's like yeah that that's in there but really the the meat of it for me is that he takes his time like this is you know a, a few paragraphs and it's just like about how a guy has started to take his daughter for granted it's yeah. very kind of mundane and, yeah. and but it, it's powerful nonetheless I agree. I think in in that book, Barry is just not a character. You just you write Helena and then that's your main character and you don't invent this other character whose purpose really is to just bring that kind of stuff to it. Um, so but I'm glad this book did for sure. And so he divorces his wife still. Um, his daughter ends up dying anyway because the the 
the memory of dying is so much to her that she takes her life. Um, so you said you don't that that's a bummer for you. And it is a bummer. It is for sure a bummer. But I don't know. There's something to and I don't want to call it fate or destiny or anything. But there's something to the fact that, hey, like sh- this shit happens in the universe. And like, even if you try to change it, you're only going to delay it. Like, I love the idea that like he looked back at his failed marriage and said, well, here's the obvious reason it failed. This is it right here. Like, of course, like I can't imagine going through that, going through the loss of a child and then your marriage surviving that. Um, Mm -hmm. And yet the honest truth is it would have puttered out anyway. Yeah. It wasn't that great of a marriage in the first place. Yeah. I mean, I I did like that aspect of it. I I guess I, I was a bit depressed by the idea that she just kills herself immediately, which um, I found a bit jarring because there's a lot of people who die and then are brought back to life by the time looping stuff and they don't uniformly kill themselves immediately sure it's i mean just a, her that does it a lot of them do like a, a, like when he wakes up in the uh the precinct in the third act like every one of those cops is pulling out their guns that's true and, but isn't that because they know they're about to be nuked sure sure um, I, I don't know like i i, I don't want to i don't know what it would feel like to be dead and then <laughs> and then not be dead the, well, I, I think so. So the first time it happens, it's with the it's with the the druggy guy they have in the, in the lab, and he kill and, and he's like, I was dead, and it was the most beautiful thing ever. I could experience every moment in my life at the same time, and it was well, great. That, right? That was when he went back to a dead memory. That that's what happened when he went back to a dead memory. Oh, I thought because that's a that's a setup for what it's like for Barry when he goes back to the dead memory at the very end of the book, where he goes back to his first memory and is like, I want to live here forever huh yeah that's what that is okay i thought that that was he literally okay well the only reason the only reason i know that is i read that i was considering pulling that bit and i I didn't i thought you couldn't go to a dead memory i i guess i'm i I don't want to turn this into talking about extremely That's, that's how the book ends he goes to a dead memory and that's how the book ends matt he goes that's to how a... he fixes everything at the end of the book i know he, he goes into he goes back to the memory of him and Julia like sitting there. I thought there was some particular trick that allowed him to do that. Like why didn't that occur to the, Okay, this is a, this is a legitimate <laughs> question. Why didn't it occur to them to try that before the end? It, it, like I, I get there was some obvious reason why, but I just didn't get it. Because they did it and the guy died and then Slade figured out how it wor- they figured out how it worked and Slade went back and erased the timeline in which they figured out how it worked. And so he was just like, it just doesn't work. And so they just never did it. OK. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, I, I get it. it. It is it is complicated. Uh, yeah, maybe I didn't fully get it the first time through. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, we have a slide of him going through the memory. So I'll, I'll give you my theory on why why Barry is successful when no one else seems to be in that moment except for Slade rather um when we get to that slide but yeah okay that's like that's how that's how he fixes the timeline or that's how he gets rid of all the other timelines is he goes back right. to the one dead memory timeline before everything yeah because you can truncate things if you if you go I mean I like I like the way he phrased it it's it was almost obvious when he's like yeah you, you it's not the time that matters it's the causal path that matters right and I was like, well, that makes sense. <laughs> but, but then I was like, but why didn't they try that before? And then people in the chat are explaining it to me. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, they, they did and they were successful. And then, of course, once you know that information, you can go back and just delete the timeline in which that information was learned. It's like yeah. real It's like real time travel at that point, not, okay. not this kind of di- different take on time travel. I gotcha. Anyway, we got a little distracted there, but we'll... we'll, I, we'll I, We'll circle back around to that. Because, but I mean, it, it's good I cleared it up because otherwise I would have kept saying things that didn't make sense. <laughs> it's all good. Um, all right, next one. So Helena teams up, teams up with Barry to put a stop to Elon Musk invading his hotel. Helena makes uh, a save point and then saves Gums to win, and we get to experience <laughs> the process through Barry's point of view. So this is fun, right? right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. We'll yeah, read this and then fun. we'll talk about it. What the hell are you doing? Barry asks. Helena's eyes are shut, her mouth hanging slightly. Slightly open, perfectly still. Barry carefully pries the knife out of her hands. For a long moment, nothing happens. Then her bright green eyes snap open. 
Something in them has changed. They exude a newfound fear and intensity. You okay? Barry asks. Helena sur surveys the room, glances at her wristwatch, and then wraps her arms around Barry with startling ferocity. You're alive. Of course I'm alive. What happened to you? She leads him over to the bed. They sit, and Helena removes one of the pillowcases and tears off a strip of cloth, which she begins to tie around her self-inflicted wound to stop the bleeding. I just used the chair to return to this moment, she says. I'm starting a new timeline. Your chair? No, the one up on 17. Slade's chair. I don't understand. I've already, leave, I've already lived the next 15 minutes. The pain of cutting myself just now was a breadcrumb back to this moment. It left me a vivid short-term memory to return to. So, you know what's about to happen? If we go to the penthouse, yes. Slade knows we're coming. He'll be waiting for us. We won't even make it out of the elevator before a bullet goes through your eye. There's so much blood, and I start shooting. I must hit Slade, because he suddenly is crawling across the living room. Um, it's fine. This, this is so fun. I, I yeah. mean, like, I, I wish I could fit in the part where she says, I'm making, I'm making a save point, and she stabs herself, because that's uh -huh. just really funny. But... I, I love that, like, not only is this fun, I love that the first time we really get to see it used this way, we're seeing it from the point of view of the guy who is not doing it, but is just sitting there having to experience it. The fact that he was just, like, in the middle of talking to her, and then she just, like, freezes and her mouth's, like, agape for a little bit, and then she just snaps back into awareness, and, and but it's different. It's, like, her conscious, like, she's, it's a person that's experienced the next 15 minutes already. I, I really like it. I agree. Yeah, it is more fun being from his point of view. And, and um, because it, it makes this all like disorienting, but in a fun way, because they're using they're using the chair to loop back. But then Slade and his crew are also using the chair to loop back. So they keep one upping each other and just creating increasingly ridiculous situations. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it, it just yeah, it's a great, um, great part of the book. In retrospect, it's it's like a it's the it's what happens on a global scale in microcosm. Like it's, it's setting up what's going to happen on a global scale later in the book um, yeah. with, with two competing sides kind of using this tech against each other. Exactly. Exactly. It's um, really cool. This is kind of more like personal scale and thus it's, it works out more as an action scene. Whereas at the end it's just repeating apocalypses. Yeah. And, and I love like, so we, we didn't talk about it specifically, but basically what happens is Barry is like, he's lost his daughter um, every everything's bad because all the timeline just caught up to whatever shenanigans Slade is doing, and Hel Helena just like walks up to him, and is just like, "Hey, we've known each other for years. I'm here to help you. Let's go." <laughs> and yeah. like, and like, I love that that it, it really mostly keeps us locked in Barry's point of view for this whole thing because like it, it makes us it's much more fish out of water when like she has this long history with him and he doesn't know her at all and but we know her because we've been with her throughout the entire book so we're getting to really like it, it'd just be a whole different experience if we got to see this whole thing through her experience um, yeah. rather than his it's sort of necessary because otherwise we would have to go off and like talk about the 17 years that she spent doing something else and then coming, you know, with Barry and then coming back to this moment and it would all feel very anticlimactic. Like, I think, I think one big driver of like when he chooses to switch points of view is to avoid situations where you just have to erase a big part of the story and be like, okay, none of that mattered because yeah. we looped, we looped around and we erased all that. So usually it's the point of, it's the point of view of the character who didn't actually have to experience it that we stay with. Sure. Um, and uh, not, I don't know if that happens in all cases. I can't really keep it or that organized in my head, but it seems to be the case most of the time. Yeah, I think I think most of the time. I mean, I think this part right here, as I think five, six, seven is saying, is not actually the timeline that ends with their success in uh, on the raid. I think that uh -huh. they they go back again. There's another reboot before this. Yeah, well, because he gets killed. Like at at the end of this, he gets killed and then he like wakes up somewhere else, right? I think so. I mean, so, like the the end of this thing in totality is him dead, like yeah. dead, dead, dead until she goes back to the eighties, right? Yes, but yeah, I think there is another moment where he, like, I can't I can't remember exactly how it goes, but the, I mean, this is the book is uh, the book is starting to ramp up in complexity, and I love that like this is about one hundred and fifty pages into it by now. And I love that it's like it's very gently ramping up. Like so you're 
you've got a core understanding of the characters. You've got a core understanding of the, the conceit. You've got a core understanding of how the timey wimey shit works. And then we're going to slowly start going up and, and complicating it more. Uh-huh. I think it's just well paced in that regard. Yeah, I agree. All right. So they finally do catch up with Slade, though, and he gives them a villain monologue as he uh, as he explains his whole motivation for everything. After you ghosted off my oil platform, well done, by the way, I never understood exactly how you pulled that off. It took me years to rebuild the chair. But since then, I've lived more lifetimes than you can possibly fathom. Doing what? She asked. Most of them were quiet explorations of who I am, who I could be, in different places with different people. Some were louder. But this last timeline, I discovered that I could no longer generate a sufficient synaptic number to map my own map to my own memory. I've traveled too much, filled my mind with too many lives, too many experiences. It's beginning to fracture. There are entire lifetimes I have never remembered, that I only experience in flashes. This hotel isn't the first thing I did. It's the last. I built it to let others experience the power of what is still what will always be your creation. He takes a strained breath and looks at Barry, Helena thinking that his eyes, even through obvious pain, contain the composed death depth of a man who has lived a long long time hell of a way to thank the man who gave you your daughter back slade says well now she's dead again you fucking asshole the shock of remembering her own death and the building that building that appeared yesterday pushed her over the edge i'm truly sorry to hear that you're using the chair destructively yes slade says it will be destructive at first like all progress just as the Industrial Age ushered in two world wars, just as Homo sapiens supplanted the Neanderthal, but would you turn back the clock on all that comes with it? Could you? Progress is inevitable, and it's a force for good. So, um, this is Slade's basic, like I said, it's his villain monologue, and I think the book basically takes this idea of progress is inevitable, it's destructive, but ultimately good, and basically says... No, you're wrong. Uh, um, and I don't know if I believe that 100%. I mean, I think progress in the case of time machine chair, yes. <laughs> I think that would probably end about the way it did. But um, I, I, I'm not sure. Like, it's clearly this is Blake Crouch's stance on the concept uh-huh. of, yeah, it's going to be destructive, but it'll be good eventually. His stance is, nah, nah. Yeah, I mean, I mean it literally becomes a kind of arms race. And, yeah. and and then it leads to a literal nuclear annihilation, which is, to, to my mind, the closest metaphor for what this is. Like, like we, we never should have invented nuclear weapons in the first place because sure. as soon as they invented nuclear weapons, now we have thousands and thousands of, of massive city-destroying fusion bombs all over the country, all, all, all over the world, enough to wipe out the human race. And it's like, well, that was stupid. Yeah, too late now. Uh, and, and and like and the thing was, as soon as that genie was out of the bottle, that was inevitable mm-hmm. in, in a certain sense. Like just if you just look at the at the world stage and the way things work. So like he he's introduced this technology, and and one, you know in the next part of the book they they use it to um to solve small crimes, right? And mm-hmm. and, and you're like, oh, this makes sense. Yeah, this is reasonable. This is a re- reasonable use of this technology. And and then of course it it escalates because what else would it do other than escalate? Um, it's not going to yeah. just stay a steady state. That's not practical. Yeah. And it just, it, it, it ruins everything and it deranges, you know, the human race completely. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with that. And I think one of the, the clever things the book does in this next section is, yeah, it kind of wins you over to the, the side of the government, the DARPA employee here. I, I honestly can't remember his name and I feel bad about that because I liked him a little bit. Yeah, yeah, he, he was cool. I like that. I, I agree. He he wasn't painted as like a buffoon. He was like clearly, people are dying every day, and we could prevent it, and we should. Right, right. Like, yeah. I mean, the concept of okay, yes, maybe we should have never invented this thing, but we have now, and we have an opportunity to do good with it. And shouldn't we? And that is an argument that I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I love the. I I, I really did love the time cop uh, period of the of the book where. Like the the fun he has with like sending these commandos back in time repeatedly to yeah. 
to assassinate school shooters and stuff. I was like, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really fulfilling. And I think, like, our point of view character throughout all this is, is Helena because Barry is dead at this point. And so she is vehemently against using the chair at all at this point. But even she is kind of won over by the effectiveness of what they're doing and, like, the small-scale clear yes this is helping people thing like preventing a school shooting stopping a serial killer from killing another child um like these are like how how could you argue with the good that is being done here you can't and then of course the book punishes you by being like well the whole time they were doing that uh these other countries were building the chairs and now all hell breaks loose and we haven't gotten to that slide yet but that's what's coming yeah uh, 567 makes some interesting points in the chat right now, one of which is that giving him 11 years with his daughter isn't nothing and, and Barry should be grateful, which <laughs> um, I, I, I think that was sort of maybe part of what I was feeling is, is, is that it wasn't Barry's perspective necessarily that bothered me. It was almost the book's perspective where it was like, well, they, they, I got divorced and they died anyway. And, and it was like she got to live 11 years longer. Think about it from her perspective. She didn't get killed by a car, and she got to she got to live a, uh, into adulthood. Like that's that's good. That's just good. But, but anyway, she, but she did get killed by a car because she remembers getting killed by a car, Matt. But she still got to live eleven years longer, which is good. And then the other thing that they said is <laughs> is that erasing this knowledge is not is not a long term solution because it would be discovered again at some point, which is definitely something that that occurred to me. And then I was like. Probably, probably, but this is such a weird thing to try to do. Like, it's hard to imagine. Like, maybe no one else ever would try to do this particular thing again, you know? Yeah, I mean, like, uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> well, well, I mean, the, the, the idea of, of shooting your memory into your brain while you are dying so that the DMT release kicks your consciousness back in time is, is literally something that I can imagine just never coming up again you know possibly i'm not saying i necessarily believe that but. yeah yeah i mean i i think i think poss i i think it is a good argument that it is possible that this technology would be discovered independently of this discovery i think i think that is possible i agree with you extremely unlikely but possible but even even with it being an extremely unlikely possibility i still think like the way the work like crouch constructs a situation here where they have to attempt to destroy the knowledge of the chair at this point because yeah. that's all they can do because things have they like the, the cool thing about this is it's time travel but it's one way time travel right you can only go back so like once something has happened it it always happens no matter what you do like how many like any change to the timeline you do it's always happened so you're stuck with things existing as they are there's nothing else you can do um so i mean like the, 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 I agree that like destroying the technology is not a long term solution, but it is the only solution for the where the present is in this story. Yeah. And I also just as a general argument, I think that in, in general, um, burying knowledge like this is probably not a, a good like like people would have discovered nuclear weapons even if the Manhattan Project hadn't happened, for example. Mm -hmm. So um most technologies i think people would discover so so a, as a general argument yes uh not a stable solution to the problem yeah but a, a solution that prevents the world from blowing up yeah is is a a, a, a temporary good solution yeah I'm, I'm enjoying the 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 debate in the chat i can't necessarily participate right now but <laughs> <laughs> uh it's fun i think um, sammy is remembering getting killed by a car equal getting killed by a car yeah, it's in your memory. If you but remember you, it happening. But yeah, but then you got to remember a lot more life. Here, here's here, here's one that bothers me still. Does does the stuff that happened in a dead memory, did that really happen? Yeah. Okay, so at the end of the <laughs> book, at the end of the book, when they erase the other timeline, did all that stuff that they erased really happen? No, it's gone. It's gone. Well, what's the difference? The memory the difference but, is if you can remember it or not but memory but that's but so what if you remember it but that's the whole book <laughs> i i still think it happened i think it all happened and then they just erased everybody's <laughs> memory of it okay i mean yes 
Okay, sure. Obvi- obviously, obviously, we'd have to define what we mean by by happened. Yeah. Um, if, if nobody can remember something happening, what does it matter if it happened or not? Well, if the, can... if no, if no person in the universe remembers something happening, it doesn't matter if it happened. Doesn't Barry, Barry remembers it happening? Well, okay, yes, Barry is the one person that remembers it yeah, happening. So it definitely all happened. Uh, sure, sure. Quid all, pro quo. I mean, like, what? Yeah. What is? <laughs> what is the point of saying happening here? Like, I don't know. I just find it what, an interesting question. What changes whether or not we say yes, it all definitely happened, versus no, none of it actually happened. This is the kind of things that philosophers spend their entire lives studying, and well, you're, you're being so dismissive. Well, those people are dumb. Okay, well, <laughs> it's on record now. I agree with you. <laughs> Now we can move Wait, on. how did we move back to you agreeing with me? I thought we were arguing. Not, not really. Um, <laughs> I, I, I just wondered what your intuition was, and then I had my own intuition. But I, I don't think there's such a thing as a right answer to mm-hmm. a question of whether something really happened because the word and the concept are not well defined. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. Um, next slide. Having defeated Slade, the government uh, with Helena reluctantly. Um, spin up their own program uh, for solving problems using the chair. If England didn't go to war war with Germany because of something we did, then Alan Turing, the father of the computer and artificial intelligence, wouldn't have been pushed to break Germany's ciphering technology. Now, maybe he still would have gone on to lay a foundation for the modern microchip-driven world we live in. Then again, maybe not, or to a lesser degree. And how many lives have been saved based on all this technology that protects us? More than the lives lost in the Second World War, the what-ifs snowball out into infinity. Shaw says, point taken. These are the types of discussions we need to be having. He looks at Helena. This is why I want you here. You aren't going to stop me from using the chair, but maybe you can help us use it wisely. Day 17. They spent the first week hammering out ground rules. Among them, the only people allowed to use the chair are trained agents, such as Timony and Steve. The chair can never be used to alter events in the personal histories of the team members or their friends and families. The chair can never be used to send agents further back than five days into the past. The chair's sole use is for the undoing of unthinkable tragedies and disasters, which can be circumvented easily and anonymously by one agent. All decisions to use the chair will be put to a vote. Albert has taken to calling their group the Department of Undoing Particularly Awful Shit, and like many names that start as a bad joke and without a quick replacement, the name sticks. Dupas. <laughs> it's, it's awesome. Um, I really like this part. I, I, I'm i really interested like that, that they, they kind of built rules around the use of this thing. And the reason why I kind of cut the slide like this is because they're using like the extreme example of going back and killing Hitler. Right. Um, yeah. Which is like the first thing everyone thinks of whenever you do time travel, you have to do the Hitler thing. And Trinkard says, do you think the guy was seriously considering going back that far? Or was it an extreme example to force discussion? Um, both. <laughs> But I think that the thing that's so fascinating to me is we know that what is that, that like we know that the end of them using the chair, even with these rules, snowballs out to horrible destruction. Yeah. And I like that, like they're talking about things like, well, what happens if you uh, if you had stopped if you if you had killed Hitler? What happened? Like Alan Turing wouldn't have broken codes. He wouldn't have invented modern computing. But. If you even if you're using it under the rules that they defined here, you still could be changing something that has an unknowable snowball effect down the road, right? Like, oh yeah, it's a nightmare. I mean, th- so here, here's the thing: if if this got into the hands of like a true utilitarian, then they would just use it to to like try to completely optimize the timeline. Like they would never stop finding things they could improve, right? Right. Right. Like you fix World War Two and you're like, oh, good. We saved like 40 million people's lives. Sure. OK. Now, suddenly the biggest tragedy that ever happened isn't World War Two. It's some other thing. OK, well, we got to fix that now because that's the worst thing that ever happened. You got to fix that. Yeah. OK, now you fixed all wars that ever happened. What's left? OK, well, we got to <laughs> fix that one famine that happened. OK, now like you use it 10,000 times. The worst thing that ever happened is there was this one dam that broke. Like, 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 like there's no justification for ever ceasing to right. interfere like that, right? There's no stopping condition once you have time travel. Yeah, I mean, the thing they talk about, you know, the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, 
Um, and they're like, well, we can't go back that far because look, I mean, look at that led to all the stuff that happened and everything would be different. And I was like, okay, well, what if like the Archduke was assassinated yesterday and like you would go back, that would fall under your rules. You'd go back, you'd prevent the assassination. Hooray. Except like that's, it's the same thing except for you just know what happens in between that time versus it happening within a five day period. Like, it's just like, like you start playing with God here and it's just, it like, it has to snowball into absurdity. Like it just has to. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) Yeah. Kyrgyzstan says rule number one is preserve a timeline where you still have a time machine. (laughs) That should, that's, that's fair. Good. That's a good rule. (laughs) But I mean, it, it is interesting though, because in this, in this scenario, like even if you don't have the machine, you still will remember how to make the machine, you know, like even if you oops yourself into a timeline that the machine doesn't exist, you will eventually get to a point where you remember exactly how to construct the machine anyway. So yeah, if you're, at least if you're Helena. Yeah. Yes. 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 Okay. I, yeah, I love the, uh, like I said, I love the, uh, the uh, time cop part of the story, but unfortunately, it it it's all too short, isn't it? <laughs> it is. It is all too short um, because the chair schematics leak. Um, they were hacked. I love that. Like Crouch wrote in like improper security controls into this. But he's like, "This is what happens. This is what happens when you don't have a good cybersecurity team." <laughs> um, so basically, we get these cr- this series of insane moments where people are using the chairs and then counter using the chairs and. I I I I love I love this part. I love the writing here. It's so good. And they're stopped on East Fifty Seventh Street. The air choked with smoke. Her ears ringing. Another headache. Another nosebleed. Another shift. The tunnel never happened. The bridge never happened. Grand Central Terminal was never bombed. Only the dead memories of those events remained, stacked in her mind like a like the memories of dreams. She woke up, made breakfast, got dressed, and rode down to the parking garage on on her building with Jessica and Alonzo, just like every morning. They were headed west on East 57th to loop around onto the bridge when a blinding flash split the sky, coupled with a sound like a thousand synchronized cannon blasts ricocheting off the surrounding buildings. They're stuck in traffic now, and all around her people are standing on the sidewalk looking in horror at Trump Tower, which is billowing clouds of smoke and flame. The tower... The lower ten floors are sagging like a melted face, the interiors of individual rooms exposed like cubby holes. The one higher up is still largely intact, with people inside of them staring over the newly made precipice into the crater that used to be the intersection of 57th and 5th Avenue. As the city screams with incoming sirens, Jessica shrieks, What's happening? What is happening? I I love this. Yeah, I like that her, like her minders don't, actually know anything about the chair so they're just completely mm-hmm. lost and freaked yeah. out yeah um the i uh the book doesn't really explain like who these terrorists are right it, it doesn't really matter it's just no it's just, it's just other countries it's just every like there's terrorists that like countries have it terrorists like not like outside of states people have it it's just yeah. it's everywhere at this it's, point it's just a cluster yeah yeah and i let blake just like, if we're going to blow something up, it's going to be Trump Tower, says Blake Crouch. <laughs> when was this written? I, I, I... This was 2019. So it came out last year. Okay. 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 So yes. Yes. He did that on the purpose. Okay. I gotcha. Yeah. There's a lot of lines in here I really like. Trinkard is putting is pointing out, as the city screams with incoming sirens, Jessica shrieks. Yeah, that's really good. I really like, um, only the dead memories of those events remained, stacked in her mind, like the memories of dreams. I love that. Like, that's like I mean, that's what dreams are, right? You're remembering your dream. and But yeah. I just the way that's described, I really loved it. Yeah. Yeah, me too. That, I mean, great, great writing. I think maybe part of what uh, registers for me as being great writing is that it sounds so beautiful read aloud. Mm-hmm, like, mm-hmm. I think um, sometimes you and I have more more or less trouble reading, d- doing the reading for this show, just because sometimes the reading is uh, doesn't flow off the tongue quite as well. And yeah, I, I no, think I that, that this right, this is just easier to read and it sounds better when read aloud. I agree. And there, I think there are some authors who have a real gift for that, like who can like, uh, and I don't believe every writer like sits down and types out a page and then reads the page aloud and says, does this sound okay? Read aloud. Because I think that's probably what's not on, on the mind of a lot of people, but some writers just have an ear for um, 
for like how something flows and what it will sound like, even if they're not consciously like reading it aloud. They just like have an ear for the rhythm of of what someone would do while they're reading it. And so they just kind of instinctively put that into their writing. And I, it feels to me like Blake, Blake Crouch is one of those writers. Yeah, yeah. My understanding is that uh, some professional writers practice writing poetry um, and reading it aloud. That not necessarily surprise me, yeah. Just, just to like practice that particular skill. Um, something that I've wanted to do and I never quite get around to because poetry is very difficult to write. Yeah, and and to read. I'm I, look. I'm bad at reading poetry. I'm real bad at it. I have to read it aloud to myself to try to understand it. Uh-huh. I would love to spend some time just like learning how to analyze and read poetry. There was an Ez- Ezra Klein podcast this week. I don't know if you listened to it. You you were I, you I did listened not. to some of his. He was with uh, one of the former poet laureates, and she was just talking about how to read and understand poetry and then would read some example poems i'm like oh my god when people good at reading poetry read it aloud it's just like the most incredible thing in the world well that makes me want to listen to that episode you should it's a really good one yeah cool 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 that's a tangent sorry everyone let's move back to this wonderful book we're talking about it's good we're talking about prose though all right next slide um are we on uh Sorry. That one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm, we're on. Okay. 13. Yes. So, yeah. So, Helena goes back to 1986, giving herself 33 years to prevent the world from ending. On the final day, Barry remembers, and we get to see what uh, we get to see that experience play out. Do you feel more like the Barry from that timeline or this one? That one. I have no idea where I am. The only familiar thing to me is you. You'll have the memories of this timeline soon. A lot of them? A lifetime of them. I'm not sure what to expect for you. It may be jarring. He looks at the range of brown mountains. The desert is flowering. Birds are singing. There is no wind, and the chill of the night air lingers in the air. No, that's not right. <laughs> anyway, um, I've never seen this place before. This is our home, Barry. He takes a moment to let that hit him. What's today? April 16, 2019. In the timeline where you died, I used the DARPA deprivation tank to go back 33 years to 1986. And then I lived my life all over again, right up to this moment, trying to find a way to stop today from happening. What happens today? After you died in Slade's hotel, knowledge of the chair leaked to the public, and the world went insane. Today is the day that the world will remember all of it. Until now, you and I are the only ones who knew. I feel strange, he says. He lifts a glass of ice water from the table and drinks it down. His hands begin to shake. Helena notices, says, If he gets bad, I have this. She lifts a cap syringe off the table. What is it? A sedative, only if you need it. It starts like a summer storm. Just a super cool drop of rain here and there. The rumble of distant thunder. Dry lightning sparking across the horizon. The initial memory of this timeline finds him. I don't know, man. I really like the writing here. Like, I, I, this Me is too. like so. Just the, the so this is this is the last book of the book where we go into literally just thirty three year long groundhog um, decades where they're trying to solve this problem, and we're at the end of the first loop here. And I, once again, we don't spend that time with Helena. We spend it with Barry only in the final moments of it. Um, And I just love how Crouch writes this like that part like he describes the the remembering as a summer storm and and goes like he takes that metaphor and then carries it forward like just a super cool drop of rain here or there the rumble of distant thunder dry lightning sparking across the horizon as all these symbols for the rush of an entire lifetime's worth of memory hitting him. Um, Yeah, it's it's so powerful to me. Yeah, definitely. It builds it builds the feeling of like a imminent, um, imminent pain on the horizon yeah. coming in fast. Yeah, I, I love it. I love I it. It works um, really well. Yeah, and and it's just this 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 weird experience. Like it, it they've Crouch has contrived a situation for this to play out here, but it is such like no one is ever going to experience anything like this in the world ever, where you have a person who you've been married to for thirty. Or not 30 20 something years standing there 
she knows this is coming. You were just talking. Presumably they were just like talking to each other, having a normal conversation moments before this. And then everything hit him and he momentarily forgets who he is. That's what, like we talked about this earlier, but I love that just that little kernel of an idea that when the timelines converge, you are the person who was in the last now dead one, not the person who had lived out the entire life in the active one. So for a moment there, all you remember is the last timeline. Your consciousness was a lot, you know, like it's just like yeah. it's weird and different. And I even even if you had like laid down all the pieces of how time travel works in this book for me, I don't know if I would have been able to come up with that little piece right there. And I think that little piece right there makes it to me like it's just like this idea that it's not you suddenly remembering memories from a lifetime that doesn't exist anymore that was real to you and the thing that does exist are the random things that you're suddenly remembering yeah it's so cool yeah and then and then after a fairly short period of time you kind of get used to it because the memories of the stuff that really happened are the ones that feel real to you and the other ones are black and white right right um but yeah i think this works um i think this works really well Mm -hmm. yeah i love it i love it too um, and so then the book, and I didn't cut anything out, any pull anything from this because it's just six loops in which they continue not to make progress. Um, they have lifetimes over a hundred years and no progress. Um, and finally Helena is becoming no function, non-functional. She's going back too many times. The same thing that happens to Slade. And so we move to the final day as Barry um, watches a tape that his his wife made him. We have four years until doomsday. Four years, five months, eight days, Barry on the screen says. But who's counting? We're going to spend that time together. You have those memories now. I hope they're beautiful. They are. Before her mind broke completely, they had two good years, which they lived free from the burden of trying to stop the world from remembering. They lived those years simply and quietly walks on the ice cap to see the aurora australis, games, movies, and cooking down here on the main level, the occasional trip to New Zealand's South Island or Patagonia, just being together, a thousand small moments, but enough to make a life worth living. Helena was right. They were the best years of his lives, too. It's odd, she says. You're watching this right now, presumably four years from the moment, although I'm sure you've watched it before then to see my face and hear my voice after I'm gone. It's true. He did. But my moment feels just as real to me as yours do to you. Are they both real? Is it only our consciousness that makes it so? I can imagine you sitting there in four years, even though you're right besides me in this moment, in my moment, and I feel like I can reach through the camera and touch you. I wish I could. I've experienced over 200 years, and at the end of it all, I think Slade was right. It's just a product of our evolution, the way we experience reality from and time from moment to moment, how we differentiate between past, present, and future. But we're intelligent enough to be aware of this illusion, even as we live by it. And so, in moments like this, when I can imagine you sitting exactly where I am, listening to me, loving me, missing me, it tortures us, because I'm locked in my moment, and you're locked in yours. I, I I love I love it like I, I didn't expect to love the love story between these two because it comes on so late in the book and yet I read this section again and I'm just like uh <laughs> yeah right it, it really does do the like you know destined soulmates thing mm-hmm. really well um uh I I I agree it's funny because at the beginning I think when, like when they when they first meet you're almost like Really, these two? Yeah. Um, but uh, I think I think the book earns it, and the, the you know the latter half spends a lot of time just being like they've spent so much time getting to know each other, and they have they have rough patches, and it's it's just this really cool investigation into like what would your relationship be like with someone when you had when you had to do it over uh, over and over repeatedly. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, like the thing, the thing I love about this, and I think one of the things this book is talking about, like this book is all about memories and like living in memories or not. And 
I think one of the things that is so powerful here is like this idea that 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 you don't you don't like you don't have to chase the memory down and get back to it. Right. It's just like, it's sometimes it's enough to just remember it. It's enough to just remember these things that happened. And, and that's what he's doing here. Right. He's, he's remembering these last two years that they had together. Um, and these thousand moments that made life worth living and she's gone now she's dead and he could go back and do it again and again and again, he could, and he does a little bit. Um, but, for the story to continue, he needs to move on and he eventually does that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I, I think it's just so great. It's, it's touching. It's, uh, it, it's unexpected. It's very unexpected considering what the first part of the book is. That's, that's maybe the most fun part about this book is how it, uh, changes gears so many times. Yeah. 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 And here's the moment where you were confused, Matt. So let's see if we can straighten this out. All right, let's 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 fix this. <laughs> so here Barry realizes how to delete the gray memories. He dives into the fourth dimension, seeing all his life at once, including his first memory. And he almost stays there, but has a realization. Light coming through a window and the shadows of leaves dancing on the wall above a crib. It's late afternoon. He doesn't know how he knows this. And the tones of his mother's singing drift through the walls into his nursery. His first, my first memory. He can't explain why, but it feels like the memory he's been searching for his entire life. And the seductive gravity of nostalgia is pulling his consciousness in because this isn't just the quintessential memory of home. It is the safe and perfect moment before life held any real pain, before he failed, before he lost people he loved, before he experienced waking to the fear that his best days were behind him. He suspects he could slip his consciousness into this memory like an old man into a warm, soft bed, live this perfect moment forever. There could be worse fates, and perhaps no better. Is this what you want, to drop yourself into a still-life painting of a memory because life has broken your heart? For so many lifetimes, he lived in a state of perpetual regret, returning obsessively and destructively to better times, to moments he wished he could change. Most of those lives he lived staring into the rearview mirror until Helena. He thought the thought almost the thought comes almost like a prayer. I don't want to look back anymore. I'm ready to accept that my existence will sometimes create pain, contain pain. No more trying to escape either through nostalgia or a memory chair. They're both the same fucking thing. Life with a cheat code isn't life. Our existence isn't something to be engineered or optimized for the avoidance of pain. That's what it is to be human, the beauty and the pain, each meaningless without the other. That's the book's conceit. That's the, uh, that's the themes where there we go. That's the answer. Yeah. And, and while, you know, a part of me wants to be critical of the fact that it states them so outright and directly here. It says like, this is what this book is about. But I think it's important because I think what matters here is not what the book is stating it believes in, but Barry coming to this realization himself. Um, and th- this is this is why this is why Barry is successful in this where uh, the guy who went back isn't because he he wanted to live. He says himself, why did you take me out of there? I wanted to live in that forever. I wanted to live in the safe, warm glow of my nostalgic memories of when life made sense, when things weren't hard, when everything was good, when I hadn't been I hadn't experienced any hurt and pain. I want to live in that forever. Um, and that's what Barry was doing at the beginning of this book. And that's what Helena was trying to do at the beginning of this book. And the success, the key to victory is to let to let that desire go to yeah. to understand that the beauty and the pain each meaningless without the other. And I go back to the slide we pulled of the the 11 years um, that he had with his daughter that he just kind of got used to him. And it's only the, the it's only remembering the moment in which he lost her that makes him value her again. Um, and that's one of the sad truths of life, right? That's just like, we, like all this terrible shit happens and it is, it is the terrible shit that makes the good shit better. It really is an amazing concept. I have a really hard time accepting it, but I also have a really <laughs> hard time like, refuting it you know like like if if you if uh, if you give somebody who's lost their child this book and then you're like okay now here's a button that will bring you that will 
alter the past and make it so your child never died. I bet a hundred out of a hundred of them will push the button. Oh yeah, certainly. Just despite having just read this book, that's like, but it's the beauty and the pain. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm gonna just push the button though. Um, and and I think that's, I mean, I think that's kind of how we're wired as animals. Like, if you give us the opportunity to undo the past, we would we would break the universe by abusing it because right. that's and and. And the, the book is right about that. And and I think that he's right where he's like, look, I, I basically – I don't really have the option of fixing everything. The only option I really have is to just nip this in the bud and, and, and yeah. we never actually – you know, never actually create this technology and never go down this path in the first place. Sure. I mean, the the line, our existence isn't something to be engineered or optimized for the avoidance of pain. I think uh, all animals would say, wait a minute, that's not right. <laughs> like, yeah. My existence is specifically designed to engineer and avoid as much pain as possible, like instinctually. Uh-huh. Um, and But to, to Michael's point here, like, if the but if this button existed in real life, um, yeah, it would be an irresponsible and wrong message to send to a person. No, don't hit that button. Don't bring back your child. But in a in a world where there is no magic button to bring back your kid, and you need to realize that that is a memory that will be with you forever, and you're not going to be able to get rid of it. You're not going to be able to change it. Um, you have to process through that. Yeah, that's that's true. Um, yeah. I mean, being being human is complicated. Um, mm-hmm. And and the book definitely forces you to con- confront some uncomfortable things that I, uh, I like like personally I'm very like anti unnecessary suffering anti death I'm I'm like if if the uh, if in the future we have the the capacity to eliminate pointless suffering um, we should uh, sure and, it, and I almost would say it would it would be terrible if we had the opportunity to eliminate pointless suffering and we didn't do that. Um, but but th- this this does kind of create a, an interesting situation where it's like, um, yeah, if you had the chance to undo suffering that already happened, then that would just kind of derange you as a as an organism. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. that's true. I mean, I think what what Helena says to him at the end is like, we are like whether or not the present is a real thing, whether or not like yes, past, present, and future like via physics might exist simultaneously and it is just our our weird consciousness that orders the universe this way whether or not that's true we are evolutionary hardwired into that that perspective on the world and you can't you can't undo that or at least we don't know how to undo that and yeah i mean like look this is taking a sci-fi concept and take and using that sci-fi concept to give a lesson and i think it's it's very explicit like either through nostalgia or the memory chair it's they're both the same fucking thing like the books the books literally telling you the memory chair is a metaphor for our propensity to look back in the past right and and glorify or glamorize or wish we could change those moments um yeah. and doing that only leads to destruction <laughs> yeah so it's a book about acceptance yeah yeah Matt, <laughs> we can't talk about that other book, Matt. That's spoilers. Well, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm talking about this book, yeah, it Matt. is about it's, it's about accepting uh, that you that that these things happen, and that's that's how it is, and mm-hmm. um, it, it it's painful. But yeah. um, I love how Tringar puts it here: going through the pain and living with it, and choosing to live on. I mean, yeah, that yeah. is that is what Barry does at the end here. He looks back, and he has an opportunity to just dive literally into. Uh, 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 the past in a place where he feels safe and doesn't have to worry about the pain and going on. And he chooses not to do that. He chooses yeah. to go back to the, to the, the original moment of pain in the book, which is the moment where he's sitting there with his wife reminiscing about their dead child. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But that's why it's a metaphor. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I well, mean, Right. I, I I think it works well that like if, if you could change things, you would just you wouldn't be happy with what you had done. Yeah. And so you might as well accept that you in in fact cannot change it. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, that that's like like, OK, let's say the button exists. Of course, you're going to press the button, but you're going to learn at the end of that pressing the button that it actually is just making everything worse. Um. So in a world where there is no button, you just have to not press the nostalgia button, which is constantly looking over your shoulder. 
it, it's funny because I, I think that maybe this is the reason why the genie legend ha- has three wishes because three wishes gives you like, you, you, you know, narrative wise, you make a mistake with the first wish. You try to fix that mistake with the second wish and you make a different mistake. And then the third wish is your opportunity to say, okay, I fucked up. Uh, let me just, uh, back out of this whole deal. Um, whereas if you, if you have infinite wishes, which is what this is, like you, as long as, as long as you know how to build the chair, you can keep, you can keep looping, then, um, you will just keep digging the hole deeper and deeper basically. And, and, and the results will be awful. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah. I mean, but looking to five, six, seven, looking to the future is not the same though. Like that's, that's, that's not, that's a complete reversal of the way like this the point is this is a reversal of the way we, we perceive things um whereas the future is just what we're constantly planning for it, it is interesting how the book makes you think about like how weird it is to be like embedded in time mm-hmm. and then to talk about moments and all that yeah 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 i mean like like trangard saying like the only way to not end up with pain in the book's world is to go back to that moment and live forever in a, a still image of you being a baby where you feel safe. And that's not, that's not a life that is literally um, a still life painting of a memory because yeah. life has broken your heart. Yeah. And a lot of people do that. Like a lot of people that have suffered terrible things, like just like lose themselves in the glorification of the past. And, and like, I get it. Like I totally get it. I mean, there's, like everyone does this on some level, right? Everyone looks back to when life was simpler. Remember, it's like, oh, like, oh, like high school, it was so much easier. School wasn't hard and I didn't have any responsibilities and I just had so much free time to play video games all the time. Wasn't that the life? And of course, you're you're flattening that time. You're only yeah. focusing on the good parts. And Right. Yeah, no. It, and, and, and you don't enjoy video games that much in the first place, for Christ's sake. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, no. So what you're telling me is that I should disassemble this time machine that I've built. Yes. Yes. Time machines are bad. Is there gonna... ever Let me this is a good question to ask. Let's let's crowdsource this. Is there any narrative about a time machine <laughs> in which the conclusion of the narrative is the time machine is good? <laughs> that was a great idea. <laughs> I'm glad I did that. Yeah, I don't know if there is. I mean, there might be ones where it doesn't settle on whether it's good or bad there are definitely ones when it's like no that was a bad call um are there any where it's just like objectively just like this was good good job us i think in the lost in space movie no back to the future is specifically the t- the time travel is bad <laughs> uh the, the ending of part three is is great though you're well, right yeah that's why it's stupid because it subverts <laughs> the damn point it just made huh but he he fixes his family. No, they're he... all happy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's just a fun. That, that that's just a fun. You know, the, the the point of that is that it doesn't really take it seriously. Yes, right? yes, yeah. yes. All right. Um. Well, let's do this last slide because this is the epilogue. I don't have anything to say about this. I just find it it beautiful, and so I wanted to read it aloud. So that's my entire purpose for the slide. Congratulations, everyone. He smells the beer on her breath and beneath it, the subtler elemental scent of his wife that he would know anywhere out of a million people. He's trying not to look at her, but the emotion of sitting beside her is almost too much. Last time he saw he saw her face, he was nailing the lid on the pine, her pine box casket. And so he sits quietly beside her as she writes an email, thinking of all the lifetimes they shared, the lovely moments, the ugly ones, the goodbyes, the deaths. And the hellos, like this one. Like the sixth time she came to him in that Portland shit-kicker bar when he was 21 years old, sidled up beside him, young, bright-eyed, beautiful, and fearless. You look like you want to buy me a drink. He smiles to himself because she does not, in this moment, look remotely like she wants to buy a stranger a drink. She looks, well, like Helena, sunk deep into her work and oblivious to the world. The bartender comes over, Barry orders, and then he's sitting with his beer, asking himself the question of the moment. What do you say to the bravest woman you've ever known, whom you've lived a half a dozen extraordinary lives with, whom you've saved the the world with, who saved you in every conceivable way? 
but who has no idea you even existed. Barry takes a sip of beer and sets down the glass. The air feels electrically charged, like just before a storm, questions avalanching through his mind. Will you know me? Will you believe me? Will you love me? Scared, exhilarated, senses heightening, heart thrumming, he turns finally to Helena, who, feeling his attention, looks over to him through those jade green eyes, and he says, Nothing. Nothing. We don't get to hear what he says. And I love that we don't get to hear what he says, Matt. Yeah. I love that that's like, that's not the story. Like, that is the next story. Yeah, it's and a great ending. Yeah, it, it really is. I was so I was actually like happy that it left us there because it's like, oh, that just lets me imagine and it l- lets me imagine a happy ending if I want to. And that's, I think, better than telling me that the happy ending happened. Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. And I love like th- this idea is like he's re- we have like two moments here where the text like gets does really short sentences. The, the ones at the top, the lovely moments, the ugly ones, the goodbyes, the deaths and the hellos. And then we go down to where the text gets really short at the bottom. Will you know me? Will you love me? Will you will you believe me? Scared, exhilarated, senses heightening. Um, so it's like it, it's it's a re it's a restatement of the theme that they did when he chose to go back to the memory, right? Uh, I, I'm gonna, I remember everything. I remember the good things. I remember the bad things. The, I, I'm scared. I'm not sure. I don't know. Like it's, it's, it's fear. The, the sense of the possibility of pain. Um, and you, what do you do? You just, you just, you just go for it. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't he like the 40 year old version of himself here? Or the 50 year old, maybe? Yes, because he, well, yeah. I don't, he goes back in time to the moment of his talk with um, his wife, right? With with his first wife. Yes, yes. And, and so it must be, it's, it's his daughter's w- would have been 20 something birthday. Yeah, and this is like the timeline in which before Slade fucked all his shit up. So she has like, she's been working for this not go anywhere tech company yeah. struggling to try to get the chair made yeah and and he's been he's an overweight cop yep <laughs> <laughs> um yeah that I, I, that's what i thought um mm-hmm. there's just a, it's 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 fun to get that clear in, in your head because like they've never really had this particular interaction before right right um, like they're they're would they met yeah i mean well they not this particular interaction, no, but they've definitely like been this age where they fell in love with each other for the first time, right? Because they spent, we never get to see it, but they spent a few months with each other um, before she came back to bump into him to take him up to the tower yeah, or something. That's true. But we never it, get to see that. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. But yeah, that's, so that's, that's the book. I liked it. I liked it too. I don't think I was overly negative. I think I just there were a few things where I was like, I liked this more than that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I liked I liked it a lot overall. I loved the especially the prose. Um, yeah, just to say that for the tenth time, um, I kind of want to figure out why exactly this prose is so so good or why I love it so much anyway. I, yeah, I, I do think a lot of it has to do with the fact that it sounds so nice when read aloud. Like it's just. And you audio booked this one, right? I audio booked it, and you're very conscious of like, this is just nice to listen to. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and it's actually got um, two voice actors. It had it had oh. two different. It had a woman voice actor for Helena and a and a man for Barry. Um, and I thought that worked pretty well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, we didn't talk about it, but this sticks out at me the moment that he goes up to her the air feels electrically charged just like before a storm and that specific kind of description is going back to what he felt like the moments where he just regained the memories of a lifetime and so it's like the idea that that crouch has attached the building of a storm up to like the forming of important memories or the recalling of important memories. I like that because it like, it draws a connection between those two moments. He's remembering a lifetime of love and and happiness in the first one. And in this, he's theoretically about to go on a journey into that same type of life. Um, And so it uses the same imagery there. Yeah. I like that a lot. I think it's a subconscious effect, but it's definitely there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so what everyone else think? Kirk Stan liked it more after the book club? Good. That makes me happy. 
if 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 just talking about a book makes you like it more, that's like my favorite thing in the world. <laughs> yeah, I, I think honestly, this conversation made me like it more too because. Uh, I mean, you can just go back to the start of the conversation where I was saying like, yeah, I liked the first part, but this, the, the the last half was was OK. And then after we went through this whole last half together and talked about it, I'm like, oh, there's a lot more in there that I like than I than I had uh, remembered. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, yeah m- my wife is the one that um, I think she's actually the one that nominated this book originally. Um, and I was I was very surprised. That she um that she liked it as much because she's not as big of a science fiction r- reader as I am. And so like part of my, part of my desire and my curiosity with reading it is like, what is it about this book that really latched? She really latched to, cause she doesn't really get into the science fiction stuff as much. And of course, like the relationship between Blake and Helena and, and the message of this book, I'm like, of course my wife loved this. Like this is right up her alley. This is exactly what she goes to for, for stories. And so uh, it was very satisfying. Like I, I read way more than my wife does, and it's it's very rare that she'll read a book of this kind before me. And so, getting to experience it while thinking about uh, what she would like and not like about it, it was was really cool for me. That's fun. Yeah. 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 I mean, uh, Michael in the chat says something that I think goes with that. That uh, he's impressed that Crouch made a love story work in the middle of such a plotty sci-fi story. Um, yeah, that's what's fun. Is I think it the the lo- the love story works. For, for the people who aren't necessarily big fans of plotty sci-fi and the plotty sci-fi is, is really fun. But then also the love story works for people who are fans of plotty sci-fi. So yeah, overall sure. it has something for everybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. I totally agree. Uh, anything else that we didn't talk about that you guys wanted to say? I love the part when they nuke the world several times and, <laughs> and it was just like horrifying and nightmarish. I, I love that. that was, yeah. It's yeah. awful. It, it like, it takes a turn because it get, like this book is, it's not, I mean, it's violent, but it's not like overly descriptive and horrifying except for that one moment where like they're melting in their bodies. <laughs> yeah. And they're seeing people wandering through the street, like blind and yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you're right. It's not. Uh, it's it's not. It's mostly. It's mostly not action, but there's definitely some action in there. Yeah, yeah. I I I guess I still don't know if I agree with that five six seven. I mean, I like. I think like the causality of the past seems to matter more, like dominoally, <laughs> than just like choosing decisions in the present towards the future i don't know yeah i don't know i don't know either i mean i genuinely think like this is kind of what i was gesturing at with my somewhat tongue-in-cheek question about like did it actually happen it's like well that's that's sort of the same as saying um do we consider all of that stuff the past or do we consider it like null um you know uh uh nan error you know yeah like like, is it, was it real? Was it, or is it just nothing now? Well, yeah, I mean, it's interesting because we were talking, like, I was jokingly saying, like, well, if, if nobody remembers that it didn't happen, but, like, with, let's, like, you chop down a tree, and then we both forget the tree was chopped down, but we can still look and see that there's a tree that fell down. Whereas right. this, the the things that did not happen like have no longer are no longer directly affecting the the present in which we live. And so everyone's forgotten about it and we can't see the effect of it. And therefore for all intents and purposes, it never happened. Right. Uh, sort of. I mean, the, the, the effect, the only, I mean, there, uh, well, I'm not entirely sure what you're asking, but I guess I would say the, the, the effect is that if he went back in time, he stopped Slade from doing anything to Helena, and then he presumably tries to start a life with Helena. So that's there is a causal consequence of all of that shit that happened. Yeah. And it just happens to be a very small splash after a lot of turbulence because he truncated the whole the whole thing. Um, gotcha. And then presumably he, I mean, I think it goes without saying that he never, he, he then never tried to build a chair and, yeah. uh, cause if he did, then 
<laughs> then he's an idiot. Sure. Uh, um, I, I think Stelhex's description here, I, I like this a lot. Reality is that which does not go away when you stop believing in it. Therefore, it's not real because nobody believes in it and it goes away. It's not there anymore. But, okay, I mean, I, I, I get that, but but um, Barry did remember it. And, and I mean, also, I don't know if that quite holds up in this context, because like if Barry had jumped back in time and then immediately been hit by a car, like the, 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 the causal pathway that led to him stepping out in front of the car still happened. Like it's all I, I, I get I get I'm not I'm being I'm being provocative, <laughs> like like the word happened doesn't actually mean anything when time travel is involved is, is I think maybe uh, the correct answer to this. Sure. Um, or, or the, I, I think it's better to focus on causal pathways because that's actually what the, what the book says. That, that's basically what Slade says. He's like, look, you, you, you guys are dumb. You, what you should have done is you should have cut, cut, the, cut this off at the root in terms of not chronology, but causality. Sure, and that's, sure. and, the, and that's the right answer. Sure. Um, uh, David asked, do you think he killed Slade in the end? Um, I, don't, I, I didn't get the impression that he, oh, no, well, no, I don't remember actually. What do you think? I mean, it seems like uh, yes. I, hold on, I have my book right here. Let me go yeah. refresh my memory of. I think, I think yes. It's a situation where Slade sort of forces his hand, right? Yeah, like he basically he sneaks into his house beforehand, removes all the bullets from his gun, and then goes in there and is basically like testing Slade. And if Slade hadn't like whipped his gun out and tried to shoot him he maybe would have left him alive, but he basically proved to him exactly the type of person he was. So, um, my recollection yeah, so was Slade's, that... Slade's dead. Slade's okay. dead. That's, that's my, sounds like entrapment. <laughs> <laughs> um, I yeah, like, it's... sorry, go ahead. I, I mean, I think the book like ends more cleanly if Slade is dead, because if he's alive, then you're like, well, Slade's totally just going to try to build the chair again on his own. Yeah, well, I mean, he doesn't have any memories of it, though. But he knows the he knows that the concept of it. Oh yeah, because we're further we're f- far enough in the timeline where he knows the concept of it. Like, cause he's gonna yeah. try to do the whole thing exactly. Like that later that night, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Um. So I mean, does he like? Does he go to Helena and is like, "Hey, um, you just came up with something, and I don't think you have fully realized the potential of what you just came up with, but d- don't 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 do it." Trust me, I'm from your future. I don't know. I, I really don't know what his approach is going to be. Maybe he's just going to be like f- try to flirt with her and, and never, ever talk about all that stuff. I mean, he's going to do the Groundhog Day where he walks around the diner or the bar and like says the past of every single person here because he's been here like 50 <laughs> times. Yeah. And then he and plays it, piano. Yeah. And then he's built a nice sculpture. Yeah. Yeah. I love Groundhog Day. I love <laughs> Groundhog Day stories. I do too. They're so fun. Yeah. You still need to watch Happy Death Day and Happy okay. Death Day to you cuz they're really good. Yeah. It's funny cuz I didn't it didn't occur to me that this is a Groundhog Day story because I usually think of those as being over a shorter timeline, but it totally is. And and Groundhog Day stories are kind of all about this idea of like having a regret or having a thing that you need to do correctly that you did wrong the first time. <laughs> And mm-hmm. it's it's funny because the lesson of Groundhog Day is kind of the opposite of this, where it's like you're gonna fucking keep doing this day over again until you get it right. And yeah, yeah. And that's exactly what happens. Um, sure. Sure. Whereas yeah. this book would have been like, except that you're a piece of garbage, Bill Murray. I don't know if that's what it would have said. <laughs> <laughs> don't bother trying to improve yourself. No, I don't, I don't think so, Matt. All right. Um, I uh, I think that's it for us, right? So let's talk about yeah. next month cuz next month is going to be a little different. So next month we are reading this fucking honkin book right here. We're reading The Way of Kings by Brandon Sanderson. Except it's real fucking long. It's a thousand pages long. Um and honestly like we've decided to break it up into two parts. And I think honestly for me Matt, it's not that I don't think any of our our listeners or ourselves could read a thousand page book in a month. I think we'll be fine with that. I literally think it's just for the purpose of the discussion, uh-huh. like trying to talk for two hours about a thousand page book, like fills me with so much dread that I just like, like, I think 
when we read the first King Killer book, I think that was like 700 pages. And I felt like we barely dipped into the book. And I was like, I love this book. I loved this conversation, but I feel like we just skimmed the book. Yeah. And so the a lot of our listeners um, really, really wanted us to read this book. But the only way we could realistically do it is we just break it up. So what we're going to do is for the next two months, we're going to be reading this book. Um, we are going to start next month. So basically, we're going to read half of it and then have a conversation and then read the other half and have a conversation. So we'll be meeting next Friday, March 27th at 930. Same thing last Friday of the month at 930 at night. And we are going to be discussing book one and book two. Um, basically, that gets us to page 450 out of a thousand, which is as close as we can get to half with it with not like starting in the middle of something i thought i thought it was uh i thought it was the the most fair way to do it it's it'll make it'll make part two a little bit longer than part one but not by too much so i think i think that's the best way to do it so that's what we're doing uh so way of kings part one book one and two that's what we're doing and this will all be on the website once we get all that done but if you only listen via this that's what we're doing so it's a little different but I think it's gonna be fun. Yeah, it'll be an experiment. Mm-hmm. I'm awesome. excited. I'm excited. I like the like the old Brando Sando. Me too. Yeah, good to return to and and I've heard that you know this like he kind of got better at writing over time, and so this one will be better than the last one potentially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so there's two more books in the series, and uh, when will we cover those? You ask. I say we'll see. <laughs> Not for a while, because we uh. We have to, we would have to do it like this every time. Yeah, we would basically be spending like several months to a year on Brandon Sanderson if we committed to that. So yeah, 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 yeah. Which look, I would love to do, but I also the thing I love about this book club is that we don't do the same author, the same type of book. We kind of branch out. I've read a lot of books via this thing that I would not have normally and really enjoyed them. So I don't, I, I love Brandon Sanderson. I love the Mistborn books. I'm very excited to read this and this series, but I like getting to do other stuff as well. So yeah, you too. All right, guys. Well, that is it. Thank you so much to all of you that came here and, uh, and tuned in live. I thought it was a really great live conversation, a lot of back and forth. Really appreciate all you. Um, and I hope we see some more of you next month for, for, for way of Kings. Yeah. If you like what we do here at Doof Media and you want to see more of it, head on over to our Patreon at patreon.com slash doofmedia and consider donating $1 a month or whatever else you can afford. You'll get access to our private Discord server as well as the ability to vote for which books we cover on this show and tons of other cool benefits. So go check that out. Yep. If you looked at the fact that we're doing this book right here and are like, how did that happen? You can stop it. You have the power. You have one 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 hundredth of the power <laughs> um we have a, a rule in our our discord that is if you nominate brandon sanderson for something he will win <laughs> uh absolutely so um yeah. don't don't become a patron just because you think you're going to stop that because there's there's no stopping it but <laughs> um <laughs> um if, if you like what we do and, and you want you want to nominate some other books you want to vote on on books away from this you want to do some non sci-fi or fantasy which we tend to do a lot uh, you can you can make your voice heard through the through the patreon yeah um and if cool. you have any questions or comments on this month's discussion on next month's discussion if you just like have some things you want us to be thinking about as we tailor the discussion on the first half of the way of kings you can send those to us at twitter at doof media or on email at, at doof media at gmail.com and that's it. Matt, we'll see you next month. Yeah, later. Well, I'll see you um, like in two days, but I'll yeah. see them <laughs> next month. I'll see you, camera, later. See you every day. Winking at the camera, Matt. <laughs> Definitely cutting that out of the, the final episode. Uh yeah true, everybody that's enjoyed true. It. that's true yeah it was it it got added and swarmed i am a little surprised that um scott lynch hasn't been performing as well i mean maybe it's just a coincidence by like the competition he's been up against but 
I really want to read The Republic of Thieves. I did read it. It was good. Yes, you did, Tringard. You always need me winking. Every time you close your eyes at night, just imagine me going. I like the uh, I like the discussion today, everybody. It felt very like, uh, I don't know. It felt like there was some 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 healthy disagreement and yeah, and back and forth. I always enjoy that. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. I always yep. say every month that this is one of the, the my favorite things we do. Um, it is. It's not like one of the most popular things we do, but I enjoy it so much. I never want to stop. Yeah, this book was saying so many complicated things, and, and I, I kind of walked into the conversation with less, I'd say less of a handle than usual on, on what exactly my feelings and analysis were going to be. Mm-hmm. So um, I think that I think that everybody's conversation actually kind of helped uh, frame some things for me. So yeah, I really appreciate that. Yeah, totally. All right, well, I have to go read um, some Stephen King and then some Pact, and then I have to... I had so much to do. So we're going to go ahead and sign off for the night. I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your Friday and your weekend. Um, don't forget, March is Madness. It's coming. Yeah. It's Sunday, 2 p.m. Central Time. Voting will be open. Can't wait. Yeah. And if you want to check out the brackets, you can see that right now at doofmedia.com slash March Madness. So go look at that. Tomorrow is also February. That's right. We have an extra day. Sweet. More downloads. More February downloads. <laughs> uh, that's that's why they give us that extra day, Scott. That's It's just for those download numbers. We're yeah. going to crush. We're yeah. going to crush it. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thanks, 567. We I, I have no plans to ever stop the book club. I love reading and talking about books. So Me I would too. do this if literally it's just Matt and I just talking to each other on a stream. And in fact, we basically did for a period of time. That is that is true. That is true. <laughs> Catch you later.